Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome everyone to this webinar today, wherever you are, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, um, for Groundwater Solutions Initiative for Policy and Practice, uh, brought by Dr. Andrew Ross, Australian National University. We're so glad you're with us today, Andrew. Uh, my name's Trevor Piller. Uh, I'm the National Partnerships here at Ice Warm. Well, look, you know, there's 27 countries here joining us today, and uh, we're so glad you can you can be with us. There's a ton of people on the board there, I noticed. Um, which we're now at the end of the year. There's about um, a, a 10 or so webinars, free webinars coming up. I won't go into each one right now. And a couple of online courses, very interesting stuff there with the uh, HECRAS uh, surface water modeling, bridges, bridges and culverts, and also sustainable development goals uh, with Tony Slatcher. We'd love you to join us for those. And Dr. Ross is a research fellow and consultant at uh, Australian National University, engaged in international projects and training on integrated water resource management, uh, mac managed aquifer recharge, groundwater-based natural infrastructure, and groundwater in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and also um, mostly, mostly works in groundwater governance. Andrew is a member of the management group of GRIP, uh, leading global strategic initiatives to promote sustainable groundwater governance and management. Uh, and Dr. Ross leads the International Association of Hydrogeologists working on economic aspects of managed aquifer recharge. This is a huge and extensive um, background. Andrew, we are delighted that you've taken the time. Thanks so much for taking the time today to talk with us. I'd like to start off um, by introducing this webinar to say that this is the second webinar in GRIP Icewarm NCGRT series on the Groundwater Solutions Initiative for Policy and Practice. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Icewarm very much for providing the platform for this, yep. and the NCGRT also to, for being involved in IWMI. Then um, I'd like to talk about the contents of um, my presentation today. So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about GRIP itself, uh, why GRIP, and uh, the key role of groundwater in global sustainable development, pressure on groundwater resources and the need for better governance of groundwater. Most of my talk I'll spend on what GRIP does and how it works on the objective added advantage strategies, activities and outputs. So I want to start by really um, talking about water and the SDGs, um, giving a context for GRIP. And um, it's important to understand this uh, global context. The Sustainable Development Goals were introduced by the, uh, and adopted by the uh, UN Council um, um, General Assembly in 2015. Um, Many of these, uh, water contributes to many of these goals and there's a water goal itself, which was a, a big step forward for water in this process. Um, uh, key goals that water contributes to include er eradication of poverty and ensuring good health and well-being. As, as, and as you can see that uh, many people are short of water, very basic drinking water services and sanitation. So water has a, a big role to play in uh, those goals. Um, water also has a big uh, role to play in eliminating hunger because irrigated agriculture accounts for over 40% of global food production and over half of future growth in food production. And turning to climate action, um, then uh, groundwater uh, is really uh, a crucial, uh, uh, so I'm sorry, water is uh, plays a crucial a role in uh, the management of natural disasters in the sense that uh, many of these disasters are water related. And uh, between 1990 and 2015, uh, water related hazards accounted for 60% of deaths, 95% of people affected and 75% of total damage costs. So now looking at uh, global groundwater and the role it plays in this uh, overall water picture, uh, aquifers store the vast majority of liquid fresh water on Earth, although uh, a lot of that water isn't readily accessible or of sufficient quality to be useful for um, human or environmental purposes, actually. Still, uh, globally, 2.5 billion people depend on groundwater to satisfy their basic water needs, and groundwater accounts for 43% of all water use for irrigation. 
and groundwater also provides an important buffer against floods and droughts and key ecological functions such as maintaining base flow. Uh, the point to realize is that groundwater abstraction is rising very quickly by 300% between 1960 and 2010. And this chart shows um, the spread of global uh, groundwater abstraction and, and particularly the areas which, uh, where it's most strong. Um, uh, that's in the USA and Mexico, Europe, um, Middle East, uh, India, and Northern China. And I'll come back to reinforce that after a co another couple of slides to show the particular areas where there are kind of hot spots or hot areas of uh, groundwater abstraction. And so here we see that uh, global groundwater irrigation intensity is very concentrated uh, in certain areas of, of those uh, continents that I mentioned. Uh, particularly here we can see in um, the uh, central part of the USA, uh, Spain, parts of North Africa, in India and North China in particular. And this is connected with limited renewability of groundwater. So uh, these are these areas that I've highlighted as being high in um, uh, irrigation intensity are also uh, have a relatively low annual average groundwater recharge. And so this leads to these regions of high, high groundwater stress. Well, understanding that there are these uh, big problems around in some areas around groundwater, um, big players in international development, the Global Environmental Facility, World Bank, FAO, uh, UNESCO, and the International Association of Hydrogeologists mounted uh, an action, a framework um, over 2011, 2015, with some major outputs, uh, a global diagnostic on groundwater governance, a shared vision, and also in the end of a framework of action, including uh, steps to adapt to local contexts, creating adequate levels for governance, building effective institutions, uh, legal and uh, managerial institutions, making the essential linkages across different sustainable development or, uh, if you like, policy goals like agriculture, environment, um, uh, climate adaptation, and uh, land use planning, redirecting finances where they were needed to create infrastructure, and starting planning and management processes in many groundwater areas where they hadn't really started. So with that, I, I want to turn to GRIP. And GRIP was really um, a, a response or a follow-up to that global initiative, or, or one of the follow-ups, uh, where a group of partners got together uh, with the aim of trying to push along this goal of sustainable groundwater management for livelihoods, food security, climate resilience and economic growth. What you might say uh, is the added advantage of GRIP, because we know that there are many uh, international uh, bodies, uh, UN bodies and other bodies that are active in the water field and have special water mandates. Well, GRIP has um, uh, a group of partners with a high level ex expertise and capacity, uh, capacity to advocate for the groundwater contribution to the SDGs. GRIP is, um, unlike the more strategic uh, groundwater governance initiative, very solutions oriented. It's a flexible and network body. It's very demand driven and able to respond to uh, different contexts. It's also uh, a very integrative body. Its partners, its members have uh, many different disciplines. Um, it covers a range of sectors. And there are a range of partnerships to both within GRIP across the partners of GRIP, but also outside to other uh, collaborators. And finally, GRIP um, uh, brings together documentation of uh, solutions from around the world with easy access to cases and tools. These are the main GRIP thematic areas, groundwater and food security with uh, specializing or looking particularly at irrigation scenarios, virtual water and gender, 
then groundwater for ecologically sustainable development, looking at groundwater development ecosystems, environmental groundwater reserves and trade-offs between environmental and I guess that you could say a consumptive goals. Uh, the groundwater, water security and climate change adaptation nexus with uh, groundwater buffers, conjunctive water management and managed aquifer recharge saying um, particularly good uh, prospects for solutions. Then groundwater and energy, uh, energy costs as groundwater uh, use is increasing, uh, are, are raising as a particular issue uh, as wells. There are more and more wells and having to be driven deeper. And also there's a question of electricity subsidies. Uh, many times uh, these energy costs are subsidized, um, leading perhaps to uh, an acceleration, acceleration of pumping uh, in areas where it's not sustainable. There's also the question of solar pumps, a, a great innovation, but also with the potential to lead to overexploitation if these are introduced uh, too fast in some places. Then um, transboundary aquifers, uh, questions here of uh, the assessment, joint management mechanisms and monitoring for aquifers that cross national boundaries. And finally, groundwater governance initiatives which bear on all of these different thematic areas. Quickly to the GRIP partners, um, this slide just shows at the top the uh, core group of GRIP, which is the group that um, carries out the main management functions, um, considers uh, membership, and makes the agenda for GRIP. And then the partners, um, very important, uh, some big players in this group, uh, like the GF, the World Bank, UNESCO, um, also many technical bodies like uh, geological surveys, and, and many other important partners. Um, the GRIP core group meets quite often, so it's had two face-to-face -face meetings in Geneva in February 2017, Stockholm, August 2018. Um, it's so far held 11 Skype meetings and the 10th meeting just occurred last week. Also, there are additional meetings of GRIP working groups on specific issues. And the top slide shows a GRIP meeting in Geneva. The bottom slide shows uh, GRIP presentation at Stockholm Water Week on groundwater-based natural infrastructure, which is, if you like, uh, an additional uh, cross-GRIP activity, and I'll talk about this, that a little bit more later. So how does GRIP work? GRIP has a strategic approach and which lead to uh, a set of outputs. Um, so the first part of that is creating long-term partnerships and the outputs involve recruitments and of course uh, developing more uh, links with external collaborators as well. Secondly, awareness raising, advocacy, communication and outreach activity. Um, thirdly, filling knowledge gaps while there are many knowledge gaps in the groundwater field and uh, GRIP has developed a, a set of knowledge products um, to kind of start to fill those gaps. And I'll talk about a few of them, give some illustrations in a minute. And then also the question of sharing transferable solutions and standing up successes through research and development projects. Um, I'll also give some examples of those. So going first to partnerships, um, GRIP had a membership which doubled in 2017 from 14 to 29. And while uh, GRIP is establishing, uh, uh, sorry, encouraging further partnerships, there is a halt to new memberships at the moment just to allow partners to consolidate their activities. The resources and funding for GRIP are kind of be split, can be split between secretary resources and uh, which are provided funding and in kind from the GRIP members where uh, and of course uh, external contributions to that are always uh, also being sought and project funding which tends to come from external bilateral sources working on the projects. Collaborating partners with GRIP um, include technical agencies and funding bodies such as in Australia the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training 
um, the Australian Water Partnership and ACR. And in Germany, uh, the geological organization BCR and the Center for Applied Water Research at University of Dresden. And then we have the World Bank and GEF, of course, in the international sphere and many others. So, and group partners are engaged in the development of project proposals and project implementation. I'll give you a few examples of that later. Turning to advocacy and outreach activities, a key activity that was undertaken in 2017 was advocating the importance of groundwater in achieving the SDGs. So through the high level panel on water, a letter to the high level panel on water, through an engagement with a high level of panel water Sherpas in Australia, Mexico and Netherlands. I've shown uh, uh, the first few paragraphs of the letter in the insert to the right of the screen. Then we have uh, a presentation to UN Water in 2017, there, early in 2017. And all these activities uh, coincided or I would like to say led to groundwater being strongly mentioned in the high level panel on water outcome report. GRIP was a player with other partners of course in bringing about that outcome but it's a very satisfying outcome. Then um, in 2017 many presentations were made by GRIP partners about the strategic importance of groundwater and GRIP in international development. 16 international meetings in 2017. I, I haven't got time to list them. I have listed a few of the activities for engagements in 2017, including contribution to the Water Sustainable Development Goal Assessment and Indicators. I've given a couple of examples there. Uh, a, an overview on groundwater, which was provided to UN Water, and I'm going to come back to that production in a minute. Um, response to a call from UN Water for input to the SDG 6 synthesis report, a note on groundwater and SDGs, and contributions to the roadmap to, on groundwater to African Water Week, uh, the World Water Development Report in 2018, uh, to Ramsar on the draft res res uh, resolution on, on agriculture, and also um, to uh, some work by the UN on um, global assessments of disaster risk and the disaster risk report of 2019. And I just wanted to mention very quickly an activity for next year that many of the group partners will be involved in. That's the International Symposium on Managed Aquifer Recharge in Madrid in Spain in May 2024. Uh, well, you're welcome to come to Spain and join that symposium. The call for abstracts is, is out now and uh, the website uh, web address to which you can send those is down at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, now I'm going to turn to knowledge products and I'd like to talk about that groundwater based natural infrastructure initiative that was presented in Stockholm. You saw a photograph uh, of that special event, uh, the panel. Um, this uh, the documentation uh, for, for this special event includes an overview of groundwater-based natural infrastructure solutions that's divided into groundwater storage, water retention, water quality and environmental support. And also uh, a guide to selection of solutions to fit various situations was produced. And this graphic attempts to capture some of the range of situations where groundwater uh, based natural infrastructure uh, uh, provides solutions and works ranging from mountainous areas, um, sand dams to try to hold water in the landscape for dry times, ranging down to some quite complicated uh, projects on the plains to remediate groundwater and clean up groundwater quality. Um, and uh, also uh, different projects to enhance habitats and payments for ecological services. I want to, um, sorry, the, and the um, web address where you can find the information on this work is uh, down at the bottom of this slide. I just want to give a couple of examples of the cases. There were uh, nearly 20 cases overall. 
Um, this is one about payment for eco ecological services for MAR in Japan. And here the issue was that some cities uh, were short of water supply in dry times. They got together with local agricultural associations to make payments for farmers to flood their fields at certain time of the times of the year to um, to have some um, uh, increased recharge and um, ensure that water supply was available for the cities and for these um, for these uh, services if you like then these farmers were paid for some loss of production that they incurred in this flooding the second example is uh, aquifer storage and recovery. Um, here we have an example from uh, Australia where um, there are some saline aquifers um, below Adelaide where stormwater can be um, stored and uh, then um, cleaned up and uh, brought up for reuse. You can see the, the way this system works, the stormwater is collected, it's uh, filtered through our wetlands which clean out some contaminants it's injected into the ground which clean out more contaminants and then it's brought up for use in urban green space peri-urban agriculture and can even be cleaned up for um, uh, for for drinking water uses now i come to um, a set of grip case profiles um, two of these have come out and there are some more in the pipeline. I've given um, uh, links to the first two and I understand that another one has just actually come out. Unfortunately, I've got the details but I didn't have time to put it into my PowerPoint but you'll be able to find that very soon on the GRIP website. And then books and reports. Um, well, I mentioned earlier there's a, a, a first of all a a groundwater overview that was prepared by the uh, International Groundwater Resources Assessment Center in partnership with IGRAC, which, uh, which really um, which was launched at the World Water Day in Brasilia this year and provides uh, information about groundwater and groundwater ac related activities by all the UN water members and partners. It's, it, if you like, a, a kind of guide to activities by the different partners. Um, making not only groundwater invisible, the, the, the uh, groundwater visible, but also all the partners working on it. The second um, publication there is a book on advances in groundwater governance, really following on from that global groundwater initiative and drawing together some of the best academic and expert work on groundwater governance. So both of those publications are recommended for you to have a look at. Turning now uh, to development projects, just giving a few very quick examples in the areas of groundwater and food security. We have uh, groundwater for sustainability, ir sustainable irrigation in Laos and Vietnam, um, groundwater for sustainable development, in, in estimating groundwater contribution to environmental flows globally and supporting the SDG processes through guidelines, methods, indicators, as I've mentioned. A few projects on groundwater, water security, and climate adaptation, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, projects on uh, groundwater and energy, the use of solar power as a renewable crop. So um, solar power as an alternative to pumping groundwater for some uh, smallholders in India, and also uh, improvements in the um, management of groundwater by really regulating and managing electricity as in the geotogram projects in India. I'll give an example of transboundary aquifer management in a minute and then the groundwater governance example of that book I already mentioned. So now looking at these examples, first of all water security and climate change adaptation. To explain that groundwater through its natural buffer capacity is central to water security, resilience and drought mitigation globally. So aquifer storage enables conjunctive management of floods and droughts and mitigates the risks of both. If properly implemented, sustainable groundwater irrigation can help protect sub-Saharan Africa from negative impacts of climate change 
and also from over exploitation as has happened in some other parts like India and northern China. So projects in that space, underground taming of floods for irrigation involves depositing floodwaters underground and withdrawing water during droughts. The managed aquifer recharge in villages project involves working with smallholders to uh, better manage and measure their groundwater uh, in order to improve their water security. Uh, the Grow Future project is from Africa assessing long-term chronicles of groundwater levels to improve knowledge of renewability and storage. And lastly, a project is being developed in the Sahel region to develop groundwater for irrigation, um, gathering lessons and guiding countries. Um, just briefly on transboundary aquifers, uh, these aquifers often cross watersheds and national boundaries, creating some quite difficult governance problems. And there are now nearly 600 of these transboundary aquifers identified globally. These are likely to become more and more important as water becomes scarce. So setting up joint mechanisms and cooperation is critical to ensure sustainable use. And there's this one uh, project in the Ramotswa that GRIP is engaged in at the moment. As a, I'm just giving this as an example. Uh, GRIP does have other engagements. But this one is mapping the aquifer through airborne geophysics, conducting transboundary diagnostics, developing stakeholder awareness and a strategic action plan, advising the regional authorities and setting up a subcommittee under um, other sort of management committees between relevant states, the Botswana and South Africa in this case. So I'm coming towards the end now of the presentation. I just want to uh, outline the GRIP work program for 2018 and 19. Uh, one component is going to be further mapping and identification of groundwater solutions, really following up and expanding on that groundwater-based natural initi uh, infrastructure initiative and uh, trying to build a, a web base for these solutions or where we can gather and uh, put up um, uh, solutions for uh, outscaling and further um, communication and development. Engagement in sustainable development goal processes and the development of methodologies. I think I've mentioned that. Um, some work on groundwater in the World Development Report on, in 2019. It's about leaving no one behind. And, uh, you know, there are some quite major issues for groundwater there. But because some people, um, uh, some communities, um, some disadvantaged groups and, and women, have relatively poor access in some areas to uh, groundwater and so we will be looking for examples of solutions to be um, out, put into that world development report as uh, examples of best practice and then i've uh, probably covered enough about the follow-up on the groundwater based natural infrastructure initiative we'll be uh, developing uh, a further web product, web base, and uh, perhaps a, um, a policy brief on that. Community uh, continuing activities, uh, well, we'll be going on advocating, um, carrying on these advocacies in UN and other international forums, developing case profiles and other knowledge products, and working on further uh, ideas for development projects. And of course, uh, I'm sure that you'll now be wanting to know how you contact GRIP. Uh, GRIP has a, a website. I'll show you the homepage in a minute. And on that site, there's um, a scope to a button to send messages to contact GRIP. Um, there's a con this contact button that you can access and send messages. Um, you can also contact GRIP partners directly, as especially core group members. And, and this is, you know, if you just have general questions or you have ideas for new activities, uh, we'd be glad to hear from you. So then my take home messages is, first of all, groundwater plays a, a key role in achieving the UN SDGs. Secondly, GRIP is aiming to raise awareness about groundwater opportunities and threats to share and scale up solutions 
and to disseminate knowledge. There are really huge opportunities to develop groundwater sustainably and contribute to livelihoods, food and water security, and climate change resilience. And I'm sure that the audience out there can think of many more than Grip has already thought of. So we'll welcome your thoughts. In some regions, it's also necessary to address aquifer depletion and groundwater contamination, which is having a huge impact on affected po populations in those areas. You'll remember the slides I, I showed you at the beginning. Please contribute to the GRIP program of advancing global sustainable development through sustainable groundwater management. And with that, I'd, I'd like to end my webinar and thanks very much for your attention. There are Thank a few you. references. Um, yep, yep, absolutely great. The first one comes from Islam Al-Haq in uh, Islamabad, Pakistan. He's with a group called Eco Steps. His, um, his question says, um, uh, what are the latest software, softwares for ascertaining groundwater potentials and other parameters? Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I would just mention perhaps that there has been um, uh, the development by um, the UN and uh, also GRIP of a, a kind of framework for the assessment of groundwater. Uh, that involves um, um, the assessment of resources, uh, right. socioeconomic aspects and governance. Um, uh, I guess it's uh, in documentary form which uh, is, is available. Uh, I would call that uh, management software. Um, I think that's quite an important contribution that has been made and that framework is being used by um, some of the GRIP partners and by UNESCO for their work on groundwater in, in Africa in particular, I know. But uh, yeah, so on more specific software, perhaps the, uh, the question related to that and perhaps we could explore it afterwards. That's for sure. No, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, Austin Taboo uh, has asked, you'd like to have more information uh, on the development and research projects in the Shire, South Africa. I don't know whether you are able to respond to that here, uh, but there's yeah. been a bit of interest in that from others as well. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, um, actually a project that is um, being carried out by um, uh, various uh, international partners, um, the International Water Management Institute and uh, IGRAC, who are both uh, GRIP partners, are involved in that project. Yep. Um, they uh, would have detailed information about the project. I, I must say, uh, I don't have it to hand myself. I did uh, certainly raise that as an example of our work, and I could definitely um, send that caller more information. Yep, no, that's if for sure. If there's any other callers uh, who are interested yep. in that question, yep. uh, I can definitely respond. Okay, we'll be in touch then straight after the webinar. That, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, Ananda Kumar is um, delighted to see the good work being done in India, especially around Mar and Marvi, uh, and go really good to know about GRIP. Um, uh, Ananda also says if we want to be in touch with um, GRIP developments, is there any way to do that? I guess the GRIP website. Yeah, I think it, that, that that's where you can um, you can yeah. find, uh, I think I've got this screen. I don't know if people can see, still see the my presentation or the final slide in my presentation. Well, they, they can't, but what we've but, done, okay. what I we've think done that, Andrew, we've, we've put it into the chat line so everybody has got that. Now, got that yeah. GRIP website uh, so, URL in the, in the yeah, chat line. Okay, so in the, um, GRIP, on the GRIP website, there's a button there called News, and that's where you'll find all the okay. latest news on GRIP. Okay, so that, that's very helpful. No, thanks very much for that. So thanks, Ananda, for that question. That's great. Um, Karen Vilholt uh, has uh, said, uh, oh, thank you, Karen. That's really great. Uh, Austin, I can give you more information on the Shire um, TBA work. Uh, 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 Karen Vilholt from uh, IMI. That's great. Uh, Karen gave the first um, uh, webinar last week. It was fantastic. The week will last on the uh, group. So, yes, uh, she'll be in touch, Austin, and also Ananda. Thank you. Yep, got that. Yeah, That's great. Yeah. So, we'll take care of that. <coughs> yeah. Yep. 
no worries. Thanks, Karen, <laughs> for that intervention. Yeah, wonderful. Basant uh, Maheshwari uh, is in the University of Western Sydney. Thanks very much for the presentation, Andrew. Very informative. Uh, groundwater is still slow in getting into the agenda of national governments. So in your view, what is one of the reasons in this regard? Mm. Okay, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think a lot about that question. So really, uh, one way to look at it is that uh, a lot of the policy is focused on water, as though it's something homogenous. Mm. And um, a lot of the debate around water policy doesn't uh, understand that water exists above and below ground. Groundwater does uh, stay invisible. Uh, and, you, you know, it, it has got different specialists or um, technical disciplines who are particularly associated with it, which uh, is another issue. Um, I think um, the Bassant's question is extremely good one, and it just underlines that we really do need this advocacy scream of grit work. That's what we're trying to do yeah. in advocacy. And also, of course, by putting out solutions and trying to upscale solutions. But the advocacy part of our work is particularly trying to raise yeah. awareness of the importance of groundwater in the overall water cycle, right. the uh, contribution that groundwater is play, playing or to the achievements of all of the sustainable development goals, which, which isn't fully realized right now. No, no and this is, this is one way to, to get the, um, get the um, uh, word about GRIP and what GRIP can do uh, out. And I'm so pleased everybody's joined us here today for this webinar. Uh, Karen goes on to say uh, to uh, Ananda and to everyone, you can subscribe to GRIP news updates from the website and receive news to your email box. So you, this is a, another uh, avenue for but thanks very much, Karen. That's, that's great. So subscribe to news updates going to that group web, website. It's terrific. All right, we've got a few more questions here and we'll press on. So we've only got about 15, 14 minutes left here. William Ateo from uh, WA, I believe. Yep, Shire of Mikathara, Mount Magnet, Belgu and others um, in, in Western Australia. Uh, so pleased to join this webinar, says William. Just wanted to know how much time and effort has gone into Australia, in particular, the water that goes to the ocean in Kimberley or River to be used right throughout Australia. Uh, if you don't have time to get to this question, it's okay. But there's a couple of people that are asking the same question. Yeah, so I, I think I should just make a comment here that, yeah. of course, um, water in the northern part of Australia is a long way from the... Right. Uh, parts of Australia which most need it, like, for example, um, cities in the south part, southern part of quadrant of, of Western Australia. It's, um, you know, thousands of kilometres. There have been investigations of the possibility of piping water down. Um, I don't think that that idea is completely off the table, but uh, most of the scientific assessments is it's really far too expensive mm. to... to uh, pump groundwater over those long distances and makes it a, a long water transfer. Water's so, a heavy, heavy, heavy substance and it's not expensive enough. It's not. So we're really looking charging. for other water sources that are closer to the places of use, yeah. uh, like aquifers, like recycled water, yeah. where uh, surface water is already short. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Pravin has asked, what are the sensitive parameters we need to look at carefully to sustain groundwater and how will grip, uh, could GRIP help in funding that? So what are the parameters to look carefully at sustaining groundwater? Mm, Probably a big uh, I think that's rather a, a big question. Um, and, and also the word parameters quite tech, makes it technical. So I'm not quite sure whether Pravin means uh, sort of more the more technical questions like uh, understanding recharge or evapotranspiration or technical parameters in that way, or whether it's more the integration of a whole lot of different information, which I was trying to suggest when I introduced the case of integrated groundwater assessment, right. looking at both the technical, but also the socioeconomic uses and, and the governance aspects. So, um, well, if Pravin's got time, he may, may would like, maybe like to um, come in and um, um, say which particular aspect he's interested in. That might be the way to handle it. Very yeah. important. And no. GRIP, of course, is trying to help to, um, uh, I, I guess, develop or understandings of both. As far as funding goes, um, GRIP is not itself a funding body. Right. And that's important to understand. It's a, a, a body, it's a, 
a, um, a partnership of experts, which has a more a kind of advisory and uh, information um, gathering and sharing and promotion capacity. Um, so indeed, uh, GRIP is looking for funding rather than, yeah. uh, you know, a small amount of funding uh, yeah. would be very uh, helpful to uh, expand our range of services. No, thanks for that question. And it's a bigger question and maybe it can be, um, it can be pursued further outside of this webinar. Uh, Jag Dish in uh, India has asked, uh, should industry be allowed uh, groundwater recharge using treated effluent to achieve zero liquid discharge? So it's a governance type question. Um, yeah, well, um, my <laughs> broad answer there is yes, that's all right, providing that the um, proper regulatory standards are met. Yeah. So yeah. actually, as a model, uh, Australia does have uh, a, a set of guidelines on MAR for the use of uh, treated effluents that cover the use of treat effluent, I should say. Yep. Uh, fairly, very comprehensively, they've been developed in Australia uh, and are in use. Um, happily, um, also the, with the work of uh, some of our GRIP collaborators, like my friend and colleague Peter Dillon yes. and others, uh, uh, a set of um, groundwater guidelines, I, sh I should say my, my guidelines for India has also been developed, yes. taking account of local circumstances in, in that way that we, we do try to uh, adapt to uh, local capacity and need. And uh, that's also available. So uh, I would encourage um, you know, him to get in touch with uh, either me or Peter about that if he wants yep. information. Yep. Got a great comment from Malawi, Andrew Jaloza, who's a hydrogeologist there, and he says, great to know about GRIP and what it does, also interested in more details for the Shire Aquifer. Thanks, Andrew. We'll uh, follow that up with uh, Karen's comment about um, uh, bringing some of that information to bear. Uh, we'll do that after the webinar. That's great. It's got a ton of questions here, and we've only got about seven minutes left to do this. Um, um, Mal Fernando, I think it's a broad question, but uh, what are the policy and governance in implications for implementing ma in australia well so so again that's um a very broad question i think you know i've mentioned uh, obviously you need a uh, good a good technical and regulatory framework for ensuring that uh, ma um, can be done safely um so uh, and i've covered that i've talked about the yep. uh, international yep. ma guidelines as far as policy goes, um, there are, are also some publications. Um, the National Water Commission put out uh, some work uh, on policy and governance implications. Uh, I've actually also uh, done some work in that field, so I'm I'm happy to share it um, yeah. w with uh, you know if if that um, I'm, I've lost now the the questioner on screen. But uh, that's right, Mal. Mal. Yeah. Mal right. Fernando. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Good. Definitely, uh, he can get in touch with me. I, I, I had my um, my address up there, and uh, I'm glad to share that. Yeah. Uh, so there are some. There is a little bit of work still to do on governance. Um, for example, provide to ensure that people have the right to recover water that they store underground is yeah. not completely protected yet, and also yeah. you need to have fairly long. Um, what we call carryover periods, the ability to store water underground and leave it there for several years and then pick it up later. So these yeah. things are still under development, but I can talk to Mal about that. Sure, that sounds good. Uh, Katie uh, Colburn is a researcher in uh, UNSW Sydney. Great webinar. Thanks very much, Andrew. How do we avoid the waning interest in groundwater resources that happens when we are not in a period of drought? <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that that's the hydro, question, what we call the hydroelogical cycle. Illogical well, cycle, yeah. <laughs> you know, so you can almost hear the uh, mm. some groundwater practitioners um, yeah. being uh, glad in some perverse way when perverse. droughts occur. Well, of course, this is a, a terrible thing. Um, in fact, um, you know, the... Uh, this is not at all uh, so easy to understand. So um, I guess the, the fact is that um, people who are groundwater users are obviously very much focused on their day-to-day -day activity. 
uh, and I would would say that when groundwater producers are in good periods and making good returns they can see then their opportunities to do a lot more work expand their businesses and yeah. so on and it absolutely makes sense it makes sense to me too yeah. uh, as a kind of small business person these days myself yeah. mm -hmm. um, the thing to do though is just bear in mind all the time that then dr uh, the droughts will come around it again and it's important to have those, uh, bear in mind those things and not overexpand uh, your properties or, and also to develop your, your buffers, you know, and your yeah. alternative sources. So that's what we're also trying to stress in some of our work on uh, MAR and this, uh, as, as a tool to respond to climate change. We're in about uh, four minutes to go here, so I think we might back up the last question. There's a few few comments on the board, but this question from Sogo in Nigeria, it's not actually a question, but um, um, thank you for the presentation, Andrew. From the groundwater map on, in the presentation, Nigeria read no data. What are the data, data requirements used in the map? Because I know we have some local data here in Nigeria. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. So uh, there are quite a lot of uh, African countries which are reading in that way. I, I think what that's telling us is not that Nigeria itself has no data, but the transmission of Nigerian data into those, um, those particular global databases from which those studies drew their data has been imperfect so far. So uh, that's the answer. And yeah. Yeah. Um, anything that uh, Sogo uh, could do to uh, work with national yeah. authorities to push that along would be great. Uh, if he wants to contact me about that um, uh, to get some hints about what might be done, I, I, I could. I'm happy to have Absolutely. a brief discussion. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Yes, yeah, so go. So that's that's great. That's what the webinar is all about. Really making links like these where we do get better data <coughs> going into our databases. That's fantastic. Uh, just a couple of comments here. Interesting from Ananda's uh, about taming of flood. Uh, underground, that's great. Uh, and William makes a mention about Slow Mountain Scheme, that's good. Uh, um, ProLad, uh, is there support from Grip? Well, well, I think we've got to that one. So I think we're there. I think we've made it and we did it within an hour. It's such a, a broad and uh, big brush, Andrew. Uh, thanks so much for your time and effort on this. And thanks everyone for, um, for uh, your, your um, uh, questions. And they're still coming in. I'm sorry, we, we, we have to give it a miss. Um, but uh, we do appreciate the effort you've gone to everybody, especially for yourself, Andrew. Look, um, feedback that will come on the window in a moment when you close down. We'll, we will email you the link to the recording uh, and you can see all the free webinars coming up in the next uh, couple of uh, months uh, and the online courses. Uh, go to our YouTube channel there at Australian Water School and you'll pick up all the resources yeah, okay. that we're uh, doing now. Okay, so, uh, Trevor, thanks very much just briefly from me to you sure. and your production team yeah. mm. uh, for those uh, few, getting us through those few hiccups at the beginning. That's, that's we great. Got there. We got there. Terrific. Thank you uh, very much. It's such an important topic. Um, thanks so much, for Andrew, for your time and effort on this. Also to Joel and to Michelle's team here for helping. Uh, everyone who joined in, thank you for, for joining us and so much more we could talk about. Thanks for Martin. I see the question there, Anriza. I'll, I'll make sure those questions do go to uh, Andrew after this webinar so you may hear back from us on that. So stay tuned. We'll do this again very soon, probably next week. In fact, uh, 24th October, Atlas of Groundwater Defended Ecosystems by Ben De Gregorio in Bureau of Meteorology. Um, thank you for joining us, everybody. Thanks once again, Andrew. And uh, we'll say bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au